is um, kind of funny. <laughs> number, nine or number, number nine. Number nine. That is, um, the hypothesis was let X and Y be norm spaces, but Y compact. A norm space is not going to be compact. And this is trivial. <laughs> okay. All right. So there was something fishy about that. The hints in the problem are great, but uh, so I'm actually going to go over that, a revision of that problem for the case of a metric space. All right? So I think he meant, let, well, I'm not sure what he meant. <laughs> I made up a couple alternative versions, but I said, well, this looks fishy. I'm going to make up a different problem and give you some examples to show, see what you can see what's going on. Okay. So are you planning to give a talk a week from today? Today? No, not today. A week from today. A week from today would be perfect. Okay. Okay? So you're on for the um, May 2nd? Yes, that is Okay. Um, so this is homework number 11, uh, homework 11, which is still due this week, right? And then we have one more homework. I'm hopefully, I've got a new set of notes here, a special theory. Um, we'll see how much we get through it. <laughs> I hope, hopefully we can get through all of this, but I'm going to start today after I get the closed graph theorem. So today's going to mostly be about the closed graph theorem, but then I'm going to switch into uh, the spectral theory so that we have a chance of getting something done before next week. You wouldn't want to give any homework hints this week, would you? I just, I sure. looked at the last two, the, 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 I don't know, the first three I'm just having a lot of trouble with. First three on this homework. Not at all, really. Okay. Let me look what I did with my homework I solutions. I was asking, but... I did them, but I think I left them upstairs. But I can still respond to questions about them. Um, 4.11, that's really nothing more than, um, than just what they're saying here in 4.11. See, what, what were the homeworks? 4.11. Number eight. <coughs> Uh, 4.12 on the open mapping theorem it was two problems there, 6 and 8. And then 4.13 I've changed it by taking one problem and adding an extra credit problem. Okay. Uh, 4.11 you've got uh, he's calling it the number uh, he's calling He's looking at the integral minus h to h of x of t, dt. Okay. That's a, x is just some continuous, well, that's actually not just continuous, it's, it's yeah. going to be continuously differentiable. Yeah. Continuously differentiable function. And this is just the basics of, that? of doing estimation, of doing. Of, um, Can we use that on page Error page estimates. About the Norm. This is about error estimates, but basically he's got two little problems together here, and he's just it's just kind of recalling all the stuff you've already done and recalling that you've got a semi-norm. He's just kind of recalling a definition here in part B. In part A, you've got this, and you want to show that that if you call um, if you call this. Uh, 2h x of 0. In other words, replace the, the function x of t by its value at the origin, then this is obviously the integral, okay? Plus the remainder, which he calls r of x. He can just call it r, but it depends on x, okay? So what is r then? r is equal to integral minus h to h. You can easily see that it's x of t minus x of 0 dt. And all you're going to do is estimate r by putting an absolute value, bringing it inside the integral, and using a mean value there. Okay. You yeah. <laughs> mean value them for derivatives. Okay. And then getting this estimate coming out. So what you're going to get is then you're going to get that r, you're going to get that dot, dot, dot. Okay, r is less than or equal to, therefore, to the maximum of the derivative, which comes from when you apply the mean value theorem, t and minus h to h. Apply mean value theorem for derivative. Well, that's how I did it anyway, <laughs> for derivatives. 
No. No, you can find it in, anywhere. Yeah, I know it is. I mean value theorem. Okay. Yeah. So then you're going to get this times um, times times h squared, as it turns out. Okay. If you do the actual calculation. Okay. And this is what he's calling a semi-norm. He's just calling this p equals p of x. Okay. Okay. And he's saying, well, that should be a semi-norm. Well, it's not negative. It satisfies the triangle inequality. And um, that's, you know, and it satisfies the scaling. The scaling. So it has a scaling, non negative, semi norm. Is a semi norm. Okay, it um, satisfies P is non negative, uh, P of alpha x equals alpha P of x, and uh, P of x plus y is less than or equal to P of x plus P of y. That's what it's got to satisfy. You need to check those. Okay? It doesn't satisfy um, p equal to zero if and only if x is a zero function because a constant function has zero derivative. Okay? So it's not a norm. So he's just recalling that there's this function c1 running around. So really what it's, it's about is kind of reintroducing c1. Okay, so x is supposed to be in C1, functions with one continuous derivative. And then this problem 14 discusses uh, the C1 functions again, roughly speaking. Okay, uh, what in 412? 412, you have. Um, six and eight. Six is straight, uh, and six and eight are um, applications of the open mapping theorem, actually just the bounded inverse theorem, both of them, okay? The bounded inverse theorem is a particular statement of the open mapping theorem, right? So problems 4, 12, number 6, and 8, well, I think it's just the bounded inverse theorem. Uh, okay. Um, what does it mean to be an injective bounded linear operator? What does injective mean? One to one, but not, not necessarily. Not one to one, right. So injective means that, that it is invertible from the range, right? So t in number six, you have this t is injective, which means one to one. So and t is t is bounded and linear. So then uh, t inverse from the range of t back to x exists. T x to y. Okay, x and y were norm spaces. Let's see, are they Bonnach spaces actually? Bonnach spaces. I'm not going to be able to read that very easily. So we have Bonnach spaces x and y in number six. So you do need that for the bounded inverse theorem. Well, but of course, um, in the bounded inverse theorem, the assumption was t was onto. Well, t will be onto the range of t, which is a vector space in its own right. And is also, uh, but it will be a Bonnach space if and only if the range of t is closed in y, right? So if range of t is closed, then directly by the bounded inverse theorem, t inverse is bounded. Isn't that half of it? Bounded if and only if r t is closed. You have to use the fact that the closed subset of a Bonnach space, closed subspace of a Bonnach space is again a Bonnach space. So one half of this theorem will be directly. Then the other half is, suppose that um, so that if, if the inverse is bounded, then range of t is closed. 
Okay, well, what's the usual thing you do? You just check it. <laughs> check. So, so you need to show this bounded, bounded if and only if range of t is closed. Okay. So you, so I said that uh, the reverse direction, if it is closed, this was immediate by immediate by bounded inverse there. Okay, and then the forward implication. Well, what do you do to show so the range is closed? You let y n be in the uh, let y be a limit of some sequence from the range of t, right? So let, then what happens? I don't know. This is what I would do. I can't remember what I did. Let y n be in the range of t with um, y n going to y, y belonging to capital Y, your Bonnach space. Okay? What does that give you? Well, since you're in the range of t, that y n is equal to t of x n. Okay? Right? Now, you need to get the x n's converging to something to get something good, it looks like. Okay? Yeah. Okay, how will they converge? How will the x n's converge? You're assuming that the t inverse is bounded. Okay. So, uh, is that what you're assuming? What are you assuming? Yeah, you're assuming that this is bounded. Okay. So xn is equal to t inverse of yn, right? Because yn is in the range. Okay. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the xn and the yn. Okay. So here you have a bounded operator, and here you have a sequence which is convergent. Okay. So I think the hint is look to Cauchy sequences because you have, you have this Bonnach space, right? You have to look to the fact that y in its conversion implies that it's Cauchy. And then you can get a limit for the x's. Okay? Hint, use Cauchy. <laughs> Condition. Satisfied for y. Okay. Okay. Number eight. I think that's number eight is really. Um, this has just to do with equivalent norms. What you're supposed to do is, is say you've got two spaces. You can call them x and y, but I'm going to say basically you have the identity mapping from x with norm. One onto one to one onto x with norm two. So we have two Bonnach spaces given because it's assumed that both of these norms are complete. Okay. We assume we have two complete norms. Okay, on the same space, and what you're supposed to show is that um, you show that. Show that, let's see, uh, x n 1 converges to 0 implies x n 2 converges to 0, all right, um, if uh, implies the following, uh, implies that. Uh, there exists uh, a greater than zero and b greater than zero, so that uh, a times the norm of x with respect to the first norm less than or equal to norm of x with respect to the second norm less than or equal to b x with respect to the first norm. Okay. Well, <coughs> let's see. This is. Um, I think what you're going to show is that uh, what this is really going to show. You have. This is obviously a bounded. Excuse me, not bounded. This is obviously a linear mapping. Okay? The identity is obviously linear, but is it bounded? 
well, it's bound if only, because it's linear, if only if it's continuous. And this, this is going to establish the continuity, I believe. Okay, let's see. Uh, I need that, in particular, when x1 goes to 0 here, I need that xn2 goes to 0. In other words, uh, it's con continuity at the origin, right? Continuity at the origin, because this is i. This is, this, this is, this is, this, if I call this star, Star in particular implies that that um, I that that x n goes to zero implies that I x n goes to zero. Okay, that's what it says. Okay, because it because in the in the uh, image space you have to apply the norm two in order to make something go to zero, right? So you have to take the norm of this, but I x n is just x n. All right, so that's what this star star means. All right, that you have continuity at the origin. Of course, you have a linear mapping, you have continuity at the origin, you have continuity everywhere. Okay, so therefore I is bounded. Therefore, you can apply the bounded inverse theorem again. Okay, because it's one to one onto. So you have to set it up right. And. The closed graph theorem, we haven't discussed that yet, so let me get to that now. Okay? So I'll give you a hint about problem 8 from section 413 as well. Because <laughs> I'm going to do a revised version of 9, and you'll see what's going on, I think. Yeah, I was talking to some other people, and we all agree this, this latter part, this has been harder. <laughs> We're all having a harder time. Hard time putting it all together? Yeah. Okay. Well, you have these main theorems. Main <laughs> theorems. Okay, we've all decided I'm done. Okay. You just decided it's gotten hard, and I don't know if the material got harder or if we're more tired. Um, okay, well, I think pretty much, yeah, well, you had the Hanbonic theorem we spent a lot of time on, and then we had a couple other little yes, sections. Right. You've got these big theorems. You've got the big theorems, uniform boundaries theorem. Bare category theorem is kind of big, yeah. okay, because there's a lot of analysis in there. Open mapping. So you have these Bonnach spaces. Now you have the open mapping term, which is very abstract. You don't see the application of it yet until these very last set of some notes. I think I'm going to use it just a little bit at the end. So it's one of those things. But what you're seeing is the bounded inverse there. Okay? You're not really seeing the open mapping term so much. You're seeing the bounded inverse term. So we're kind of using these theorems to sort of as a as a guidepost to do some more problems. Um, but the closed graph term, we're definitely going to want that. Um, and it's not that hard to explain, and it's not that hard, period, okay? Uh, it's just that you're going to have to bring all these ideas about um, closed sets back again. And there's a lot of stuff about closed sets and open sets, what's continuous. Uh, after you get experience, you'll see that it's not very bad. For example, he's starting to use the fact that a, that a Okay, a linear mapping is continuous if and only if it's bounded. And also, some of these things, how do I establish that a mapping is continuous in general from a metric space to a metric space? The inverse image of a closed is closed, or the inverse image of an open is open. That's from the very be uh, beginning on metric spaces. So that's something you had maybe in the previous course, and I'll check to see whether it's something that's continuous by saying if the inverse image of a closed is closed. So then he has kind of a way of then, okay, and so therefore, if I, by the open mapping theorem, if I know the forward mapping is open, okay, it sounds open to open, therefore the inverse mapping takes uh, open to open. If it's, as long as it's the, the T is, is uh, bijective, then the inverse mapping is going to take open back to open, so the inverse is going to be continuous and therefore bounded if it's linear. Okay, so there's the body inverse there. So you can see how some of these ideas at least mesh together pretty well. As long as you're comfortable with thinking about continuous mapping, it says inverse image of a closed is closed, or inverse image of an open is open, um, then the conditions kind of start, you know, working together. So let's have a look at this last theorem, the last main theorem, which is not going to be that hard, but it's going to be another application of the, um, not of the bounded inverse theorem, but of the um, yes, it is another application of the bounded inverse theorem. Okay. Yeah, bounded inverse theorem. 
So, this, so in essence, uh, I remember at the end of the hour last time I was saying, well, what am I gonna, how am I going to use the open mapping theorem? What's the bound and inverse theorem? Version of it. Okay? That I'm going to use. I'm going to use it today in this closed graph theorem. So, it's not real tough then. So, main thing that I need to talk about is what the graph is. Everybody knows what the graph is, right? <laughs> Let's see. They should do an example. Okay? Let's do an example. Let uh, F be mapping minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 to the real line defined by F of X equals sine of X. So this is a nonlinear mapping from one metric space to another. From um, from metric space minus pi over two to pi over two, which is a compact metric space, to the real line, which is a non-compact metric space. Okay, but anyway, I don't even need the real line really there, but because I could going from a compact to a compact. But there you have it. Okay, so you have a function. What's this graph? All right. What's the graph? The graph of f is going to be the set of all x comma f of x. x belongs to minus pi over 2, which is going to sit um, inside the Cartesian product of minus pi over 2, pi over 2, and r. Now, how do I make, uh, what is a Cartesian product? Well, you just put two coordinates. Okay, if I have two metric spaces, x and y, x and y metric spaces, then I can talk about the Cartesian product, just all ordered pairs, x cross y is simply all x, y, okay, where x belongs to x and y belongs to y. So it's just ordered pairs. We're familiar with that with graphs, right? <laughs> so here's the graph, the picture of the graph. Right was uh, minus pi over two to pi over two, so uh, it's just something simple like this. Okay, so there was a graph of y equals sine x. Okay. <clears throat> this, but what's the um, that says a set of points, but what's the metric? What's the metric? And the metric, let's say d x one y one to x two y two. The simplest way to do put a metric on this Cartesian product is just to use a sum of metrics. That'll be d of x one x two d one plus d two y one y two, where d one is the metric on x, let's say, and d two is the metric on y. All right. So what kind of metric would this be? This will just be if I actually used um, Euclidean metric for minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So that's the value of the difference of two numbers is the distance. Same thing for R. The absolute value of the difference of two real numbers is the distance between those two real numbers. Then what would this distance be? This would be a, um, you take the sum of absolute values. Right? So in the case of a, in the above example, you would simply take x1 minus x2 plus y1 minus y2. Now that's not the Euclidean metric, but it's equivalent to the Euclidean metric and we're only, if you're only working in two dimensions, okay? So, it's good enough, all right, to, de to determine the topology <laughs> and convergence and whatnot, okay? So, the question is, is this graph closed or not? Is this graph closed in this particular example? Is this graph closed in this Cartesian product? So I'm talking about the Cartesian product. Of course, you could talk about it. So this, this is x cross y in this case. It's just this vertical strip. Of course, I could just talk about is it closed in a plane as well. Okay? It would be the same problem. Uh, it would be closed in this, in this set if and only if it's closed in the plane. Okay? Uh, in this case, turns out. But <clears throat> so you might want to have instead. You might want to work with the domain being minus pi over two, pi over two, and have a larger space. 
okay? This could also be sitting inside R cross R, okay? So that's another way you can think about it, okay? So then is, is this graph closed in the plane, all right? Is it? How would I know? How would I check to see whether the graph is closed? Use the usual thing. But x n, y n, okay, prove g is closed. This is one of those things that we do in the other class a lot. But prove g is closed. Let x n, y n, so in R2, right? Because that's what we're talking about here. This is equivalent to R2, okay? Let x n, y n go to x y, all right? where x n, y n belongs to the graph, all right, for every n. All right, I need to show that x y belongs to the graph to show closed, right? To show G is closed, we show, we've done this a million times, right? <laughs> that x, y belongs to G. x, y is just some point in R2, all right? I need to show that it actually has to be on the graph, all right? How do you do that? Well, if x n y n goes to x y, then in particular x n goes to x and y n goes to y, because that's component wise convergence. All right, we'll obviously follow. Okay, if the if this if the sum of these distances goes to zero, then each of these sum, sum ends must go to zero. Right. So, in particular, x n goes to x, x n goes to x. I don't know that, and y n goes to y. Now. <clears throat> now, what about the domain? The domain here is a closed interval. Therefore, x is in minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. All right? Minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 is closed. All right? That was important here. Okay? Closed domain. All right? So, <clears throat> so x is in minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 because xn is going to x, right? And xn was in minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. yn itself also, yn is equal to um, sine of xn, okay? And sine is continuous on that interval, all right? By continuity of sine, Okay, you have that uh, yn goes to sine of x. Therefore, because you have yn going to sine of x and you also have yn going to y, therefore y equals sine x. Well, therefore xy is in the graph. Okay, so I use the, the continuity. All right, I use the continuity of the sine function. Okay. But if I take an open interval minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, right? Even though f is still continuous, x is not in minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. The graph is not closed in that case. Obviously, if you don't put these endpoints in here, then you can get the graph going to, uh, you can get a limit equal to an endpoint, which is not in the graph, all right? So that's not necessarily a closed graph. So the graph may be closed or not be closed. Now what we're going to do is we're going to consider um, a linear operator, not necessarily bounded between uh, norm spaces. And of course, I can still talk about the Cartesian product of norm spaces. Norm spaces is a vector space in particular. What you'll do is you take the sum of the norms to be the norm for the Cartesian product. And, of course, and then, of course, you get the, the distance corresponding. Okay? So let's talk about now what we're going to talk about is, is just linear functions for the time being, though I'm going to come back to this nonlinear one, all right, because I want some more examples, <laughs> okay? But, so his theorem, the closed graph theorem here is going to be about linear operators. Suppose T 
Closed. Okay, so closed uh, operator. Suppose T is mapping the domain uh, some domain of T to Y. Okay, and domain of T is is some vector space inside a norm space X. X and Y are norm spaces. And is linear, and T is linear. Suppose T is linear, but I don't say bounded yet. Okay. And define the graph G, is, which is also called G of T, is equal to the set of all pairs X T X, uh, with X belonging to the domain. Okay, and this is a this is a subspace of the Cartesian product S cross Y, where I'm going to define. Um, X cross Y is the norm space equals the norm space with elements ordered pairs X cross Y, all right, and norm um, norm of X Y is equal to the norm of X plus the norm of Y. Of course, you have two different norm spaces to define those two different norms on the right. So this is the norm of X in the X space and the norm of Y in the Y space on the right. Okay. So exactly the same way as we did over here. The distance between two points would therefore be the sum of distances in the two spaces. Okay. Okay. It turns out that it's very simple that if you assume that um, that if this is that if DT is a closed subspace and T is Bounded, that means continuous in this context, then, uh, then by the same exact proof over here that the graph is closed. Okay? So that's 413-5A. Uh, if DT clo is closed in X and T is bounded, that means continuous, bounded and linear, because we're assuming the linear case here. So I'll be careful. All right, then the graph is closed. All right, so that's exactly by the same proof over here. Exactly the same proof as I just gave for this little y equals sin x business. Okay? Because you go ahead and you start with a, a sequence of points in the graph. All right? Uh, you need to show that, that that has some limit x y in the Cartesian product. Okay, you know by component wise convergence that if x and y n goes to x y, then in particular x n goes to x y n goes to y. The distance, this piece of the distance goes to zero. This piece of the distance goes to zero. Therefore, you get this. Since d t is closed, you get that x belongs to the domain. All right, and now you're going to use continuity. And also yn is equal to the txn by continuity of t at x. All right, you get that this business and you're done. Okay? So then you do get x, y is in the graph. So it's exactly the same proof. So I won't repeat that little lemma. I'll go to part b when, when we get, come back here. So, but what's the converse? Okay. That's pretty much the closed graph there. Okay, so suppose X and Y are Bonnach spaces. Did I use Bonnach spaces anywhere here? No, I did not. Okay. I did not. Okay. So now I want some kind of converse. Well, what would that be? I want to say that, well, what's the, uh, well, what's, what's the definition? Okay, the def first of a closed operator. I, I'll give the definition first. <laughs> I need the definition before I can have the theorem. Definition of a closed operator. So you might have some closed operator that's not bounded. 
Okay, that's important. We're going to see that in the application when we, well, if we do get there to chapter 11, okay. The closed operator that's not bounded in this quantum mechanics uh, example, okay. Closed operator, um, so as above, T is closed operator, T is closed, as, closed in the above context of context if, all right, the graph, this graph is closed. G is closed. Okay, there it is. Okay, that's the definition. All right. So, if it's bounded and the domain is closed, then it's a closed operator. Okay? So, bounded doesn't necessarily imply closed. This is up for linear operators again. Bounded, member, bounded and linear means continuous. So that's really what's being used here, the continuity, okay? So the continuous operator on the closed domain is closed, okay? What about the question of if it's closed, is it bounded? Okay, I think that's how it's going to go. If X theorem, so this is a closed graph there, 413-2, if um, X and Y are Banach spaces, it is a short proof. You'll be glad to know. Okay, so this is really an application of what, everything we've done. So it gets easy again, <laughs> believe it or not. Okay, after all that bare category theorem and all that good stuff, which we used, of course, to prove this, this bounded inverse theorem, because we used that bare category theorem to prove the open mapping there. So now I have bonic spaces, and let T be the closed operator. Be closed, where the domain of T is, of course, the subspace of X. Okay? If the domain is closed, All right, then X, excuse me, T, is, is indeed continuous, is bounded, closed and linear. I'll just put the linear here for emphasis. We are talking about the linear in this problem, so I'll just write it down, okay? Let T be closed and linear, where DT is, if DT is closed, then T is bounded, okay? What's the proof? Proof, something very easy, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, this graph, which is now a closed subspace, and we're simply going to project it down to the domain. We're just going to take the point in the graph and project it back to the domain of T. I could call this the graph of T. They put, the, they put G of T here. G of T. G equals G of T for the graph to indicate its dependence on T, okay? Okay, so how's that going to go? You're just going to take X, T of X is going to go mapped to, back to X, okay? You've got the pair in the plane, <laughs> so to speak, all right? And you're just going to graph it back to X. Now, what is that? Obviously, that's on to, okay? But it's also uh, one to one, all right? Uh, if two if two pairs are equal, okay, then the x is in particular equal, okay, so the images are equal, all right. So it's one to one. Remember if x one and x one t of x one equals excuse me if I'm sorry I got to do it the other way. It goes the other way. If x one one to one. Obviously, that's obvious, that's the definition of function, but it's one to one. If x1 equals x2 is what I meant. If x1 equals x2, that's the y value, the image, okay? This is the image. If px1 equals px2, then x1 equals x2 because that's what px1 is. I'm sorry, excuse me, px1. Let's put it this way, px1 tx1. 
equals px to tx. So I'll write it down formally. This implies that x1 equals x2, which implies, of course, that x1 tx1 equals x2 tx2. Okay? So the points are equal. You can't have two different images. You can't have the same image unless you have the same point. Right? Think about it on the graph y equals sine x. All I'm saying is, uh, if I project down, okay, I can't get the same projection unless I was at the same point upstairs. Okay? All right. So that's kind of obvious. That's one to one. It's also on to. On to. Also on to. On to dt. Because any domain point x can be picked up because I used all the domain in, in here. Okay? I use all the domain in the definition of the graph. So all the domain will come out. And what about norm? So it's obviously linear as well. If I add two x's, uh, well, if I add two things here, then it's linear. So um, so linear obvious, linearity obvious. Okay, what else do I need to check? How about continuity? Then I have um, P, the norm of P x T x. Okay, this is equal to the norm of x, which is trivially less than the norm of x comma T x. Okay, which on the other hand is equal to x plus the norm of T x. Okay because of this, right? So, by definition here. Okay? So, this norm is one, therefore P has norm at most one. That's all I care about. So I have a continuous onto bijection between, let's see, you're assuming that the graph is closed because you're assuming this is a closed operator. You're also assuming that the domain is closed. Therefore, we have two closed subspaces of Banach spaces. If x and y are Banach spaces, then the Cartesian product is going to be a Banach space. Obviously, if x is complete and y is complete, then you take a Cauchy sequence in this norm, that will give you Cauchy sequences in x and y. All right, so you'll get two Cauchy sequences. Each of them converges, and so this is going to converge. So the pro Cartesian product of two Banach spaces is going to be a Banach space. All right. Therefore, G of T, G of T is closed by assumption. And is a subspace. Because we have the linearity here, it really is a subspace. Okay, it's a linear structure, this graph, because T was linear. All right? Obviously, uh, you add any two things here, you can add them and so on. Okay? It's a subspace, and so it's like a, it's like a um, line you know, or a plane or something. Okay? Uh, and it's a subspace of, a, of the Banach space X cross Y. Therefore, uh, G of T is a Banach space. Let's see, I needed Banach spaces, right? I needed complete things, right, to get this bounded inverse there, right? We were dealing with Banach spaces. And DT is also, likewise, DT is a Banach space. Because I assumed that the domain was closed. Okay, so we have bounded inverse theorem applies. Therefore, bounded inverse apply, theorem applies. Therefore, bounded inverse theorem applies to P. And we obtain, therefore, that 
the inverse is continuous. The inverse, which maps uh, x back to x t x, is continuous. Uh, I, I mean bounded. Okay, bounded and linear. Okay, so that means there. Therefore, the norm of x t x, which is equal to the norm of x plus the norm of t x, is less than or equal to some constant b times the norm of x, all right, for some b greater, less than infinity. Okay, <laughs> zero less than equal to b less, less than infinity, zero less than b less than infinity, and therefore, actually one, b has to be at least one, but there you have it, and therefore in particular t of x is less than equal to b x, b minus one x. I'll put one here. <laughs> Therefore, t of x, okay, is also equal to b minus one times x, okay? So t is bounded. T could have been the zero mapping, okay? Okay, so b minus, uh, you know, b could equal one, right? In that case. Uh, all right. So the main thing is this inverse mapping. Okay, is bounded. All right. Well, that's the proof. And let's see. I think we need some more examples and some homework. And then there's another application. What other kind of things can happen? Okay, there's an alternative definition of a closed linear operator. That's 413-3, and that's exactly the method I was using to establish um, whether the graph was closed or not. Is it just use that method, which is going to get used over and over and over. You're just going to use the same method. Let xn, yn go to xy. Okay. Okay. Then um, the graph is closed if and only if x is in the domain and and y equals t of x. Okay. So this is the alternative characterization 413-3. All right. T from dt is uh, to y. Again, this is just norm spaces case is closed linear is closed if and only if um, whenever xn comma uh, let's see if I want to write it xn comma xn goes to x I'll just break it up into the two pieces xn goes to x and y, instead of using pairs and yn equals txn goes to some y okay Use Z or something if you'd rather call it a different name. Okay? Then X belongs to the domain of T and Y equals T of X. Okay? In other words, XY belongs to the graph as well. This is the same. This is if and only if whenever X and TXN goes to XY then um, xy belongs to the graph. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. With okay with with xn tn txn in the graph. Okay. Then xy belongs to the graph. All right. So so this is what we're going to use in practice. Um, to check to see whether something's closed. I'll just go ahead and set up the x and y in. Here though, instead of using the ordered pair, I'll just say the two things happen, because that's component-wise convergence. x and t, x and goes to x, y, if and only if x and goes to x, and y and goes to y. All right? <clears throat> Where y and is t of x and. Okay, so that's pretty much the um, what we're gonna be using. Now, what's an example where this does apply? Example.
So I'm just going to take this right out of the book. And then I'll give another example that's not in the book. So example, let C, excuse me, let X be C01. That is a Bonnach space. Let's see, am I going to need that? Um, no, I don't need to use that. And let D, the domain of T, equal to the continuously differentiable functions. Okay? Continuously differentiable functions. Okay, this is just an example that, if, that an operator can be closed but not bounded. All right? Then um, define uh, T from this domain to uh, to the continuous functions. Okay, so Y is going to equal X in this case. Um, by uh, Tx is equal to x prime. Just take the derivative, okay? As long as it's continuous to differentiable, it will be again a continuous function, okay? Then the claim is that that is closed, but not bounded. The fact that it's not bounded, we think we've seen before. Um, claim T is closed, but not bounded. It's linear, uh, obviously linear in this case. The derivative of a sum is the sum of derivatives, etc. Okay, what is it? Um, t of t to the n. So take x of t equals t to the n, right? That gives you n t to the n minus one. <laughs> okay, that's a derivative. All right. And so if I take the um, the um, the uh, the norm of t to the n, the norm of t to the n equals the maximum of, we're always just using the max norm here, we're in C01, that's the basic space, okay? In both the domain and the range, okay? So the basic norm is the max norm, 0 less or equal to T less or equal to 1, that's equal to 1, okay? But the slope becomes unbounded as n goes to infinity, but n t to the n minus 1, the norm of that, is equal to uh, n, obviously, okay? So that means that uh, T is not bounded, okay? This norm is bigger than N for every N. The norm of T is greater than or equal to N over 1, <laughs> okay? Greater than or equal to N for every N, so it's not bounded, okay? All right, I'm taking the, the ratio of this norm to that norm, okay? And I'm getting the norm of T uh, with a lower bound. Okay, so you have an unbounded thing. What about closed? Okay, well, to check, check this, uh, this property here. Check star. Check star to show that T is closed. So I'm going to take um, a sequence of continuously differentiable functions that converges um, uniformly, all right? And assume also that the derivatives converge uniformly, okay? Because that's what the Txn going to something is, all right? So assume Xn goes uniformly, okay, to x, okay, and Txn equals Xn prime goes uniformly to uh, y, okay, okay, to prove that um, y equals x prime, 
Okay? Because they don't even, that to prove x is differentiable continuously, continuously differentiable, and y equals x prime. So it has to be in the domain still, right? I have to prove x is in dt, the domain continuously differentiable, and y equals x prime. Well, that's something to prove, it looks like, right? Okay, that's not totally obvious. Okay, maybe you would say it's totally obvious. <laughs> okay, if you just looked at it. But um, you need to do something. So how do you prove that? Okay, well, so uniformly on zero, one. So that's because that's the uniform metric. All right, actually, and you, you um, there's a theorem from your previous analysis course that does show you that this is true. Okay, now, um, how do you do it? You just say... Um, well, you're going to use the fact that if it is continuously differentiable, then you have some fundamental theorem of calculus. So you have xn of t is equal to xn of 0 plus integral 0 to t xn prime of s ds. We are using the fact that xn, which was in dt, okay, so we assume that it was continuously differentiable because we're starting from the domain. Whenever xn goes xn in dt, I should put in here, okay? in this criterion. Is that clear? I can't start with something outside of the domain. So if I have some continuously differentiable functions and I have them uniformly converging to some other continuous function, then in fact that continuous function is continuously differentiable as long as the derivatives converge uniformly. Okay? Derivatives has to also converge uniformly to something. Okay? Then that something is the derivative of x. Okay, here's the proof. X and T is this by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And now what do you do? <laughs> okay, well, um, this integral, let's see, X n prime is converging uniform, uh, what do I have? I have X n prime is converging uniformly to Y. Okay, so this integral, therefore, by some obvious work, goes to Y of S ds. Y has to itself be con um, continuous, all right? You already still are in the space. Uniform convergence is a good metric. Okay? Right? So this is a continuous function. Okay, y is continuous. And this obviously goes to x of 0. And this goes to x of t. So then you have this equation. Okay? So you have uniform convergence of the... Uh, the then I can integrate, right? Uh, and so this goes to this. Uh, all right. So now I can differentiate it by another fun by uh, another calculus rule, right? If I've got this, this is a good continuous function. I got this on differentiate the integral, right? So therefore, x prime of t equals y of t. And that's what I wanted to show. Okay. So what I left out was this the first, this integral to this integral. How did you do that? So this this part is simply by integral zero to t x n prime of s minus y of s um, ds absolute value less than or equal to integral zero to t uh, absolute value inside. And then you're using the max norm. That's less than or equal to the max norm. Less than or equal to the norm. X n prime minus y, okay, times t, okay, which is less than or equal to norm of x n prime minus y because t is less than or equal to one, which goes to zero, okay. So that integral obviously goes. So all I had to do was for, for each fixed t have this integrate have this integral formula, and then I could differentiate it. All right, this is for all t. Right? For all t. So then I can differentiate it. Okay. Okay, so there's an application of how you verify something is closed. What about the another example? Suppose um, note that uh, in this example 
the domain is not closed. Because if it was, since C is a Bonac space, we would have had by the closed graph theorem that this is uh, also bounded, this, fun, this mapping. So it must be that this domain is not closed. How would you see that that, that domain is not closed? So in, matter, in other words, I just proved the theorem, saying if I had, okay, a closed operator from a closed domain between, uh, and then I, and I had Bonnach spaces for my X and my Y, which I do in this case. I do have the Bonnach spaces, then the operator would be bounded. So do I have like a counterexample to that theorem? I can't, because <laughs> it's a theorem. There's no counterexample to the theorem like that. But that must mean that DT is not closed, right? Is, and so we need to show that, this, that that's been basic. That's one example that we just haven't shown here that it's sort of been lurking around. The continuously differentiable functions are not closed in the continuous functions with the, the max norm. Okay, so DT, no, DT is not closed in C01. How would I, let's see, this is another example for that. What, basically what I need is that I can show that I have uniform convergence of some differentiable functions to a non-differentiable function. Okay, it goes like this. Uh, I'm going to take the absolute value function, x minus a half. Okay, that's not differentiable, right? And I'm going to get uniform convergence by some other sequence of functions that looks like this, which is nicely differentiable. Okay, so this is the function, the square root of uh, x minus a half squared plus 1 over n. You may have seen that in your analysis course. Okay, this is the, the one on top here. This is going to converge down and uniformly to the absolute value of uh, x minus a half. This is my xn of t, and this is my x of t, okay? xn converges uniformly to x, okay? In fact, you can show, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't put x here, this is t minus a half, because we're always using t. I forgot my T is my independent variable in <laughs> this course. It, yeah, but it's a good thing to remember, otherwise you get all messed up. <laughs> so, um, X N goes to X uniformly. Well, it's just a little algebra to show it. I think you use that. If you have a, this is a square root, that's a square root actually. Okay, so difference of square roots. If you take this difference and you good old algebra trick, you multiply by the sum of the square roots on top and bottom and you get it to fall out the square root of t minus a half squared plus 1 over n minus the square root of t minus a half squared. Multiply top and bottom by the sum of the square roots. Okay, instead, and you get uh, 1 over n on top and something like a square root of a t minus a half squared plus something else plus the uh, square root of t minus a half squared downstairs. And now the denominator can get small when t is a half, but it can get it small, only as small as the square root of 1 by n. So therefore, this is less than the 1 over the square root of n, which goes to 0. So you have the uniform convergence, indeed, of that function. It should converge uniformly. It looks like it works. Okay, so you have continuously differentiable, but to a non-differentiable case. So the abs this function obviously is not in dt. Okay. So it's not close. All right. I think we'll skip the rest of this and go on to one more application. Well, at least I'll state it because I want to get into this. Well, maybe I better not do that. I better do your other problem. I better do your homework problem. I'll have to save this spectral theory till next time. I'll try to do it all in one day. Nasty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll finish it up next Thursday. Okay. So let's... Uh, well, actually, we won't have that much time because you're going to have to do your homework problems, but I'll also make some notes. Make sure you can do them. Um, let's do this little one-page handout. Did I give you the one-page handout? Um, uh, 413, number 9? Yeah. Okay, let's do one last example since we only have five minutes and it'll fill in here. Okay. So we have a simple closed graph there. Okay. Now, what's an example? So you can have closed but not bounded. Let's give another example of that, but 
um, let's see. I think um, we show a close. Uh, let's show another example of a closed mapping that's discontinuous. We just showed one, right? It was closed and discontinuous. Let's have another one just to sort of see what can happen. How about the following? How about take x equals minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 again? So as a metric space. An example, a nonlinear one, a simpler one, a simple, a nonlinear closed mapping with closed domain this time. Okay, between Bonnach spaces. Okay. That is discontinuous. Excuse me, not between, between uh, complete metric spaces, I better put. Okay. So that would, if I, I can't generalize this closed mapping theorem to nonlinear mappings in some sense, because I have complete metric spaces, okay? I have uh, a closed mapping with a closed domain. That told me if I was in the case of the linear mapping, then I would indeed have a continuous bounded mapping, okay? But here, I claim that I can get uh, a discontinuous one, okay? Of course, it's nonlinear, so I can't talk about boundedness, per se. Okay. So what is the mapping? It is uh, Tx equals the tangent of x if minus pi over 2 less than x less than pi over 2, and it's 0 if x equals plus or minus pi over 2. Okay. <laughs> this is my T. Uh, x. This is T from this to R. Okay. How does that work? So that looks like this function that basically goes off to infinity. And you wouldn't think that the graph is closed. But let me just check that, that star condition again. All right? Let's just see if the graph is closed. This is the graph, g of t. All right? This goes all the way up to infinity, then all the way down to minus infinity, OK? At pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. And then I just, to close the endpoints of the interval, I just put the function 0 at those points. Now, is that a closed graph? I claim that it is. If xn, yn goes to xy, so xn, yn is in the graph, okay, then I have two cases. Then in particular, then xn goes to x, all right, and yn goes to y. <laughs> okay, and yn goes to y. Now, I'm not saying what yn is yet because there's two formulas here. But, <clears throat> um, of course, it's txn. I can always write that much of it. Okay, goes to y. Now, x, because the interval is closed, therefore x is in minus pi over 2. x is in minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 by closure of the domain. Minus pi over 2, or by, clo by closedness of this. Okay? Now, closed interval. What about uh, what's going on? I know it's two cases. Now, if x, if x is in the open interval minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, then by continuity of the tangent there, then by continuity of tangent, tangent of x, okay, on that inter open interval, you get that uh, y equals tan x, okay, xn goes to x, then yn equals tan x, n goes to tan x, okay, no problem. What if x equals uh, pi over 2? If x equals pi over 2, or, okay, then what can happen, or minus pi over 2 is going to be a symmetric argument. If x equals pi over 2, what happens? Well, now, uh, how can I get convergence? How can I even get convergence xn, yn to xy? If xn is going to pi over 2, okay, how am I going to get convergence of the sequence of points on the graph? 
either I'm upstairs or I'm down here. There's no convergence, okay? Boom, 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 boom. That's far away, okay? <laughs> All right, so uh, the only way is if uh, eventually the sequence is constant at pi over 2, okay? If x then, then um, yn goes to y if and only if, so yn goes to anything if and only if xn is constantly equal to pi over 2 for all our gen. And then, of course, you do have convergence. Then uh, yn is equal to 0 for all large n. And, and so I get uh, for all large n. And therefore, y is equal to 0. Okay, and but since zero pi over two zero is a point on the graph, I'm okay. <laughs> so weird. Okay, so this is a closed set, even though it looks like it should be open because you went to infinity. It wrapped around and made like a ring. Okay, made made like a ring. So then this is closed, and then you added two points. Uh, it wouldn't be closed if I hadn't added. Well. Actually, yeah, could have, without the two points, I could have been okay as well. But I wanted to make a closed domain to make it more emphasis on the theorem, okay, that we were comparing it to. Uh, I think that will be it almost. Uh, let's see. I was going to say something about this. I did give you this handout on problem number nine. So what is problem number nine? Why did number nine look bad in the book? In other words, the first problem that I thought was a bad problem in the book. Because he took problem number nine from section 413, um, I'll just read it, it, and it even had a hint and everything. I said, well, well how, what could be wrong with this problem, right? Yeah, I asked that. I said, oh, cool, there's a hint. It's cool, there's a hint, and blah, blah, blah. But I said, <laughs> suppose I have a closed linear operator where x and y are norm spaces and y is compact. What? That didn't make sense to me. A compact norm space. You talk, we've talked about compact metric spaces or compact subsets. The previous problem talks about compact subsets. That's all fine. But when you're talk, talking about a norm space being compact, there just isn't one except the zero space. You know, we're talking the real line. is your basic norm space. Okay, it's not compact. So um, the way I fixed this was basically change, take the word linear out, change norm to metric, and take the word bounded and change it to continuous. Three changes. Okay? And sort of the analog. So say, let's assume T is a closed mapping, meaning that the um, graph is closed as a subset. A proof of why is a compact metric space and T is a continuous mapping. So here's what I'm saying. Assuming you have metric spaces, assuming you have a closed mapping, and that Y is compact. Okay, so the, so the image space is compact now. Then prove that T is continuous. Okay, so that's all. So what would be the proof? This is going to relate a little bit to your problem number eight. So how would I prove, this is an analysis type proof using compactness. What's the compactness argument? So, so 4.13 number nine revised. Assume x is metric, y is compact metric T X Y closed mapping but not linear linearity doesn't make any sense nonlinear let's say not not necessarily linear I mean it's nonlinear okay then <clears throat> um and closed just means, again, this graph is closed. We've been dealing with it here. It was a nonlinear case right there. So show, let, let uh, show T is continuous in this case, as long as the, um, the compact image. I mean, that, that, in other words, I couldn't go to R, but I was going to go to compact, then I would have had to be continuous. Okay? This was discontinuous, obviously, because you know the tangent is discontinuous here. Okay? That was obviously discontinuous, right? We're <laughs> calculus. Okay. This is con show that T, if I, if I was going to try to map to a compact, then T would have to be continuous. Proof? 
okay, uh, show T inverse of a closed, of K is B is closed whenever K is closed. Okay, that's the proof. In other words, the inverse image of your closed must be closed. That's the characterization of continuity. So what you do is you let, um, so you let, you call, define B equal to T inverse of K. I must show, must show B is closed. And I know I'm taking you over time here, but I thought just sketching something on the board might help. Because you got the page here, but it might be better if I said one word about the page. How would I show then that B is closed? Well, you've got Xn in B. Let Xn in B the usual technique, so that Xn goes to X in the metric space X. Okay. Um, then what do I have? I have Xn is equal to T inverse of Yn. So I have a sequence Yn over in K, right? So uh, Yn in K, but that's compact because it's a closed subset of a compact. Okay, a uh, closed subset of a compact is compact, but that was way back in 2.5. Okay, maybe it was a problem 2.5 number nine or something. Okay. Okay, and then number nine, you know. Okay, it was a problem. Then. K is compact. K is compact. So therefore, there exists the subsequence y n sub k going to y, belonging to capital K. All right. But now, um, okay. So now consider the x n sub. Okay. So then, what do you have? So then, um, so therefore, x n sub k, y n sub k, goes to x y. Okay, and we have a closed mapping, is what we assumed. Therefore, x, y is in the graph. Therefore, y equals uh, t of x. Okay, and therefore, x is in t inverse of k equals b. And that's all I needed to show. <laughs> okay, so use the subsequence thing to. Um, and the closure property, okay? That means the closeness of the graph. Use the closeness of the graph to show continuity here. So there's a little game with the compactness, okay? Go to the subsequence. We already assumed that xn goes, and therefore x sub n sub k must go, all right? To x. So it's a kind of a cute little game anyway. You got the paper, so that should relate to your problem number eight, okay? Thank you. Very next time.